ever. Okay, folks, we're here for Super Mega Fest 2019 at the Sheridan in Framingham. How you doing, Wookie? Having a great time today? Absolutely. <laughs> All right, we're going to get this Wookie a cookie, and we're going to have a great time. Let's check it out. I'm a, I'm a little scared here. I mean, the last thing I want is any nightmares, but uh, it looks like we're here with Nightmare Worcester. Uh, what's going on today, my friend? Nightmare Worcester. Not much. Uh, here at uh, Super Mega Fest, uh, taking photos with lots of horror fans, uh, Comic-Con convention fans. Uh, it's a good time. Well, I'm not that scared. I'm actually more relaxed. You got me that calm feeling now. I mean, uh, I mean you're not going to see me tonight when I go to sleep, right? Surprise. It'll be a surprise, right? It'll be a surprise. It'll be a big surprise, right? Is this your first time here at Super Mega Fest? No, this is actually uh, my second year here uh, as a guest. Um, at, you know, I enjoyed it last year, and the crowds here are great. Fantastic. Awesome. All right, folks, check out more here at Mega Fest. All right, folks, we're here for 2019 Super Mega Fest at the Sheridan in Framingham. I caught up right now with an iconic figure, the one and only Oscar the Grouch. Oscar, how's it doing today, brother? Where is he? Oscar! What? Whoa! What? Uh, Oscar, how did this is the first time I've seen you here at Super Mega Fest? How are you enjoying being here? Horrible. It's rotten. It smells too good in here. Get, get a lot of trash in here or what? Yeah. I'm talking to trash right now. Oh! Ho, 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 ho. Hey, I'm the best trash you're going to see all day, Oscar. Um, are you enjoying being here? I mean, this is your first time here, is that correct? No, this is my second time. I was here last year, too. Okay, you were here last year. Who do you like seeing here today, Oscar? Myself. And what about Big Bird? I saw him upstairs. Uh, I bet Big Bird's always singing and counting. It drives me nuts. All right, folks, this is all we're going to get out of here. Oscar's having a great time. We have all the, we, we're here on Sesame Street. That's right. So Sesame Street, having a great time here at Super Mega Fest. Anything else you want to say, Oscar? Yeah, I have a wish. What's your wish, Oscar? I wish you go away. All right, and we're going to do that. <laughs> great, thank you. Have a good time. Go back in your little trash can, you piece of trash. Yeah. All right, folks, check out more here at Mega Fest. All right, folks, I'm joined right now, one of the most talented actors of all time, Nicholas Hammond, right here, Super Mega Fest. Nicholas, how do you like being here today in Framingham? I am just loving being here. Everybody here is so nice, and they're so interesting, and they've all got great questions. And, you know, they know so much about the shows that I've been in that it's a pleasure talking to them all. I'm really having a great day. You've done so many iconic uh, television shows and movies. Uh, we saw about The Sound of Music. We're talking about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uh, tell us about that with Quentin Tarantino, the new movie that just came well, out. Well, you know, working with Quentin Tarantino is one of the great joys of life, I think, for any actor, whether it's Brad Pitt or Leo or Margot Robbie or myself. We all agreed, working on the film, that it was just one of the highlights of our lives. Uh, Quentin is a generous, kind, extremely talented um, uh, giving man and you just want to you want to cut off your arms for the guy and everybody brings their A game when they work with Quentin and I think the movie shows it. I think the movie is really a, a great piece of work and I think it'll live on you know the way Sound of Music has and some of the other things I've done and the new DVD coming out next month is going to have six scenes on it that no one's seen before and I think for anybody who's a fan of Quentin Tarantino it is well worth getting. And you did an iconic episode of The Brady Bunch. Remember that? How was that experience like? That was so fun. And Maureen McCormick and I still talk about it, and we cannot believe how famous that episode has become and why everybody loves it as much as they do. But they do, and we were, it, was, it was a blast to do. We love, and I love her, and I love being on the show. So again, having the opportunity to work on The Brady Bunch, which was such an iconic American series, you know, I've had a very fortunate career. And everybody remembers you as the iconic Spider-Man, the first Spider-Man to come on CBS all over the world, the movies, and the, and the late 70s. Um, this is incredible. You can see 
right here, folks, by the pictures. You had that awesome wristwatch, you know what I mean? This is before CGI. This is before long all before, of that. Long before. Um, long before um, you got picked to be Spider-Man by Stan Lee and Marvel Comics. was an incredible honor. Tell us about that experience of the television show and series. Well, I love doing the show. And as you say, we didn't have any special effects. We didn't have any computer-generated stuff. We had to do it all for real. When you see a guy go up the side of a building, he's really going up the side of a building. And I did a lot of the high stuff on the tops of buildings. I didn't do the stuff where I, with the climbs. We had someone for that. But I had that Spider-Man suit on as often as I could so I could interact with the other actors, play the scenes with them. And we wanted to make Peter Parker as real a guy as we possibly could. So that's what I was trying to do, was make him real. What do, and I about the, what do you think about the legacy of Spider-Man right now? Oh, the movies and everything came out. You're the one who started it, and then we had all the movies that come out. And what do you think about what they've done with the Spider-Man since think then? they've done a great job. I mean, you're right. I did create the character, but it just keeps building and building and building. And, I, you know, I think Andrew Garfield was great in the role. I think Tom Holland was great in the role. I think everybody finds their own way of bringing something special to Peter Parker. And I now feel like kind of Peter Parker's dad, and these are all my children. Each one gets their own opportunity to play the role. But I will always be honored that I was allowed to create the character of Peter Parker. So for me, that will always be something I will be very, very grateful for. And so are we. We want to thank you so much for your time. It is an honor. Ladies and gentlemen, Nicholas Hammond. Thank you. All right, much. folks, I'm joined right now one of the greatest pro wrestlers of all time, the million dollar man, Ted DiBiase. Ted, such an honor to have you today here at Super Mega Fest in Framingham, Massachusetts. Um, incredible career that you've had. I want to first ask you I mean, watching this stuff from the UWF, you were an incredible babyface, probably one of the top babyfaces of the UWF. How was the transition from going to beloved babyface to one of the most top heels in WWE at the time? and becoming the Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase. Well, uh, I started out in the business, as most guys do, as a babyface. And I was a babyface for a very long time in what was then called Mid-South Wrestling for Bill Watts. And uh, it was uh, when, about the time the WWF was first starting to move out, which was what, like 83, 84. Yep. Uh, that's when I decided to turn heel. And I actually turned heel in the Mid-South against Junkyard Dog, who was actually my best friend. <laughs> uh, but uh, Bill Watts was the first wrestling promoter to ever feature as his top star a black man and in the South. And so Junkyard Dog was over huge. and. And so uh, Ernie Ladd was the, the, was, was the booker, and he told me, he said, Ted, he says, you're the one traveling out a little bit. He says, be looking around. We need a, we need a heel. And so uh, I got to thinking about that. And so I went and knocked on his door, and I said, Ernie, I said, I found your heel. He said, who? He said, you're looking at him. And he, he took two steps back, and he went, oh, my gosh, that is a great idea. And so I turned heel with the Junkyard Dog, and so I had been a heel. And what was, was funny was like I'd been a heel and I was a heel for a good long while, a couple of years, and then all of a sudden uh, we do this we do this other angle where I switch back and I become partners with uh, uh, Steve Steve Doctor Death Williams. Yes, yeah, Steve Doctor Death Williams. Yeah. And so right before I'm end up going to the WWF, I'm, I'm a babyface again. <laughs> so, uh, but now I. I think the reason that Vince chose me to be this character, the Million Dollar Man, is that he had seen me just be a heel. And uh, I was the, you know, there's, there's two kinds of heels. There's the tough guy heel, like The Rock, like Steve Austin. The tough guy, the, the tough guy heel is always eventually going to be a good guy because people like tough guys. But the, the kind of heel that you never get tired of seeing him get his butt kicked is what I call the, uh, the bully heel. He talks real big, but when you confront him, he's a coward. And he backs off. He doesn't want to really, you know. And so you never get tired of seeing that guy get his butt kicked. Well, that's the kind of heel the Million Dollar Man was. I, taught, I bullied people with my wealth. Well, Vince saw all that in this in, in me, and that's how, why he chose me to be the, the character. And so, but all the other stuff that we did, I mean, you know, Vince did everything. 
I mean, even down to the, the million dollar belt, the belt was actually designed by Terry Betterich, which Betterich Jewelers, uh, the most expensive jewelry store in, in Greenwich, Connecticut. And he designed the belt. The belt's worth in 1988 when they had it made was $40,000. All the stones are cubic zirconium. In today's market, that belt's worth 200 grand. So Vince always did things, you know, up and up. And then he gives me money and he says, now we're going to use some of this money to, we're going to market office marketing. He said, now if you, if you abuse this, you're going to lose it. But on occasion, like if you're in a restaurant or having a drink, buy a round on the house, a round on the house from the million dollar man, you know, get the tab. Pay, slap down the hundred dollar bills, bring us the receipt, and we give you more money. And so I did. I would do that in a restaurant. I would do it in a bar. I would, you know. So you need to talk about social media. Forget that, man. That that word spread like wildfire. Oh my gosh, that really. You know, he people started believing I was the character. Uh, and so, and I didn't act like that in public. Uh, now I would when I would do a stunt like that. But other than that, you know, I mean, I was the character at work. Uh, but yeah, it's, you know, being a heel to me was, it was fun because it was being somebody other than who I really was. So I know, and it, I get, I get it from fans all the time. I love this. They'll come up here and they'll go, the Mr. DiBiase, please don't be offended. I hated your guts. And I go, thank you. I said, I'd be worried about you if you actually like me. One of the greatest heels of all, the way that you did the money and everything, I mean, you couldn't get a better gimmick than that, especially in the 80s and 90s. Was it based off Vince McMahon? Now, we knew that he gave you extra money to do that. Was the boy? Did you get heat from the boys by having extra money, living the lifestyle? I mean, it must have been tough to be the million. And was it based off Vince McMahon? Did he tell you that's what it was based on? Well, no, no, he didn't tell me that. I mean, uh, and I don't think, you know, you know, I guess a lot of people this, have this image of Vince being this monger of a guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. When I left, Vince, you know, he got more he got more involved in his own show, and, and and more or less on television, he did become his own character, right? Uh, but is he that way in real life? No. But he does believe. And uh, Bruce Pritchard tells a story about it. He said that they went, they flew somewhere. This was when he was thinking about this character. He said, "I'm going to prove something to you." They were sitting in first class when you when you could still smoke on a plane. And this guy behind him smoking a cigarette, and he turns around. And he says, "Man, you, could you put your cigarette out? That, that's killing me." He says, "I'm sorry. You know, it's like I paid for first class flights like you do. I'm, I'm sorry." And so he, so he says, he said, "How about for 50 bucks?" He says, "Nah." Okay, hundred bucks. Uh, he finally, I think, he offers some three or four hundred dollars, and the guy goes, "Okay." I heard that story. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. And so he looks at Bruce and goes, "You see, everybody's got a price." <laughs> Yeah, very good, by thank the way. You, thank you. <laughs> Love that uh, voice. What, what is it? Now, you were a former WWE champion, right? Is it in the books that you won it that night with uh, in the main event, no. or is it still no, controversy? It's, no, it's always the controversy. I mean, that's what it was meant to be. Did they give it to Andre? Uh, I mean, that's also controversy. Right? Well, we don't well, know what happened. well switch, right? technically, technically, Andre, because the the ref, one referee now, the other referee, technically, Andre won. He beat Hogan, technically, because one, two, three, Andre gets his hand raised. And that's the, that was the whole gimmick. It was like, okay, so Andre gives me the belt. I've purchased it from him. And so for about a week or two, I think I, I actually went to the towns and went to the ring with the belt. And, of course, they wait to tell us just right. Jack Tunney makes the announcement. You know, you did not win the title. Therefore, you're not the champion. No matter what Andre says, you know. And so they couldn't give the belt back to Andre. He wouldn't take it because I paid him off. They couldn't give it back to Hogan because technically he lost the belt. So what do we do? We have a tournament to declare a new champion, which was WrestleMania 4. Uh, how would you like being the manager of the Million Dollar Corporation with uh, your great stable? Then you managed Bam Bam in the main event with LT. and So you had a great run there. But you had a great stable. How would you like that experience? Oh, it was great. You know, I uh, obviously, obviously I loved being in the ring. I loved being a wrestler more than anything. And I, you know, I, I enjoyed doing the managing gig. Uh, but not nearly as much as I enjoyed, you know, being in the mix of it. Uh, but, of course, I, 
due to the neck injury that I had and what have you. You know, that's it is what it is. Uh, but yeah, I had I had a great time with those guys. Now you just became the WWE 24/7 champion. You won a WWE title this year at the Raw reunion. So you're still winning belts. You're still in the history books. How was it like becoming the 24/7 champion? <laughs> well, I obviously set a, another record. I, I am now the shortest lived 24/7 champion that, that there ever was. I think I had it a whole a whole hour. You know, it was fun though. It was a lot of fun. All right. I want to thank you so much for your time and such an honor. Ladies and gentlemen, everybody has a price for this man right here, the million dollar man, Ted DiBiase. <laughs> And then suddenly appeared before me The only one my heart would ever hold I heard somebody whisper, please adore me And when I looked over the dirt to go mm -hmm. Now I'm all alone Without a dream in my heart